Thank you all for that. And uh, thanks for the invitation to come back to chapel again. Always a great privilege and joy for me. I have been uh, assigned uh, the subject of biblical masculinity. So this is particularly for you girls, <laughs> so that you know what you're looking for. Um, there are a lot of ways we could go talking about this subject. I think of 1 Corinthians 16, 13 that says, stand firm, be strong, act like men. Let everything you do be done in love. Men stand firm, they're strong, and they do what they do in love. That same truth is repeated over and over again in the historic books of the Old Testament where someone says to a son or a commander, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. That's what identifies men because they are the leaders, the providers, and the protectors of women and children in God's design. One of the evidences of the corruption of the world is the empowerment of women. The feminist movement has managed not only to elevate women to a place God never intended for them, but it also has managed to strip men of their place on the same level. Men have been lowered and women have been elevated, and thus they have inverted God's design, which is clearly stated when the Apostle Paul said, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, the man is the head of the woman. That's not so much power and authority as it is responsibility to be the provider and the protector. But in order for us to know what God has designed for men, we have a marvelous portion of Scripture, and I want you to turn to it because we're going to be looking at much of this portion of the text, and that's Proverbs. So turn to Proverbs, and we're going to bounce around in the opening ten chapters of Proverbs because here we have God's revelation as to what men should be. Just to let you know that, in chapter 1, verse 8, you read, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments around your neck. Again, in chapter 2, verse 1, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. Chapter 3, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter 4, hear, O sons, the instruction of a father. Down in verse 10 of chapter 4, hear, my son. Down in verse 20, my son, give heed or give attention to my words. Chapter 5, verse 1, my son, give attention to my wisdom. Chapter 6, verse 1, my son, again, and uh, it also appears in chapter 6 at verse 20, my son, observe the commandment of your father, do not forsake the teaching of your mother, very much repeated from the opening chapter. Chapter 7, again, my son, keep my words. And even over in chapter 8, verse 32, now therefore, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are they who keep my ways. So the opening chapters of the book of Proverbs are designed for the training of sons, the training of sons. And again, there were a couple of references to that even in chapter 7. As the men go, so goes the nation. And uh, our nation obviously is in profound trouble because women have usurped what is intended by God as the position and role of men. Even outside the church, this leads to a functional society when men are in charge as the providers and the protectors. That's God's design. 
Now, what I want to do in these opening chapters, obviously, is a lot of material here, and we're not going to be able to cover all of it, but I want to introduce you to it because I think this is a place where you can always go to refresh your definition of what God expects of a son and therefore a man. But let me add one other component to this, and that is the component of wisdom. In these opening chapters, as throughout the book of Proverbs, you have wisdom contrasted with foolishness. That is to say, what God requires of us is wisdom, and what we have to avoid is foolishness. So look at chapter 2, just as an introduction. Let me read down to maybe verse 12. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom. This is repeated again and again and again. This is wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. If you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, and He preserves the way of His godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of evil from the man who speaks perverse things. It's all about wisdom. Look over to the eighth chapter for just a moment. Does not wisdom call? And understanding lift up her voice on top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet. She takes her stand beside the gates at the opening to the city. At the entrance of the door, she cries out to you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O naive ones, understand prudence, and O fools, understand wisdom. Listen, for I will speak noble things, and the opening of my lips will reveal right things. For my mouth, speaking of wisdom personified, will utter truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. It's all about wisdom, knowledge, discretion, understanding, wisdom. The end of that chapter, verse 36, or verse 35, for he who finds me wisdom finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me, wisdom, injures himself. All those who hate me, wisdom, love death. Wisdom is everything, and in particular, wisdom for how men are to live. Now, there's a lot here, and I, I want to introduce it to you and sort of give you enough insight into these opening chapters of Proverbs so that you can look at them yourself, become familiar with them, and enrich your life by digging deeper than we're able to go today. So I want to give you ten crucial lessons that every man should learn, ten great truths in Proverbs that define what a man should be. When a man exhibits these characteristics, he is a man of wisdom. And wisdom is the pathway to blessing. First, men are told, fear your God. That's where it all begins. That's the first responsibility of a man. Chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And again, in chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So this is where it all begins. It all begins, and that's why verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where everything starts, the knowledge of the Holy One, fear, reverential awe, a true knowledge, that is a knowledge that is 
defined by relationship. Fathers are to teach their sons to live with respect for God as sovereign and holy. They are to respect His Word, His law, His power, His authority. They are to fear His displeasure, His right to chasten, and even His right to judge. This involves then teaching the character of God, the attributes of God. Men, you need to know your God so you can fear your God. Go down to verse 20 of chapter 1. Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. This is, again, the personification of wisdom. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded and scoffers delight themselves in scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and didn't want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call on me, wisdom, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently. They will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. That is the pathway to spiritual oblivion, failure to fear the Lord. This is where everything has to begin with fearing the Lord. Over in chapter 3, if you look for a moment, familiar verses 5 through 8, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Trust in the Lord. Hebrew word for trust originally meant literally to lie helplessly face down before God. Lean is not incline, but support yourself. The Hebrew is to say support your life with the knowledge of God. When God is feared, so is sin. Let me just add some things that Proverbs says. Fearing the Lord prolongs life, chapter 10, is more profitable than wealth, chapter 15, brings abundant life, chapter 19 and 14, keeps one from evil, chapter 16, results in riches, honor, chapter 22, and breeds humility, and that's repeated multiple times. Listen to that again. Proverbs says, fearing the Lord prolongs life, is more profitable than wealth, brings abundant life, keeps one from evil, results in riches, honor, and produces humility. Proverbs also says that the one who fears the Lord sleeps satisfied and is untouched by evil, chapter 19. The one who fears the Lord has confidence, chapter 14. The one who fears the Lord will be praised, chapter 31. The one who fears the Lord, back in chapter 1, verse 29, will have his prayers answered. Everything begins with fearing the Lord. Now, that means having a reverential awe for Him. Essentially, worship. Worship. So if you want to be a man, this is where it starts. It starts with true-hearted worship of our God in all the fullness of His glory. Fear your God. There's a second lesson that men need to learn. Guard your mind. Guard your mind. Look at chapter 3 and verse 3. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. That is a reference to the mind. In chapter 3 and verse 23, 
Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. Over in chapter 4, again, this very familiar truth in verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Your heart is the mind. Guard your mind. Guard your mind. These graces that are laid out for us in the book of Proverbs are basically to be the characteristics that define us. Back in chapter 1, don't forsake your father's instruction, your mother's teaching. They are graceful wreaths to your head and ornaments around your neck. Chapter 2, verse 10, wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. And when that happens, Discretion will guard you, understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the ways of evil, from the man who speaks perverse, perverse things, etc., and you will avoid evil. Chapter 3, verse 1, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Again, heart always refers to the mind where the seat of thought resides. Chapter 4. Give attention, in verse 1, that you may gain understanding, for I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Verse 10, hear my son and accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. Verse 13, take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. And then down in verse 20, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Again, this is wisdom personified. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Then comes that verse 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Life is all about guarding your mind, its devotion to the truth. One more text in chapter 6, verse 20, repeating what we read earlier, my son, observe the commandment of your father, do not forsake the teaching of your mother, bind them continually on your heart, tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they'll watch over you. When you're awake, they will talk to you. What a statement. Truth will talk to you. It speaks in your heart. In chapter 7, verse 1, My son, keep my words, treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend. They may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. Men are to fear God and guard their minds. Their minds are to be occupied with true spiritual wisdom that comes from the Scripture. Let me inject another characteristic that God requires of men. Fear your God, guard your mind. Thirdly, obey your parents. Obey your parents. That may seem like something that's supposed to be said to somebody who's a child in the home, but it isn't. Obey your parents in this sense, chapter 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Honor your parents. Obey your parents in the sense that you follow through on what they taught you. That's why it keeps saying, my son, my son, my son, listen to what your parents told you. This is reinforcing the first commandment with a promise. And that is, if you obey your parents, your life will be long on the earth. Fathers are to teach their children the truth. 
to love the truth, to obey the truth. They are to use a rod, by the way, to reinforce that. They are to use corporal punishment. They are to use a rod, Proverbs says, to drive folly and foolishness out of their sons. So teaching them to obey what they have been taught demands some discipline and even some corporal punishment so that they associate disobedience with pain. Fear your God, guard your mind, honor your parents. Ladies, let me just say this to you. You want a man who has honor for his parents. That, that is a man who has been disciplined. Parents aren't perfect, but where you have someone with believing parents and he honors those parents from his heart for what they have taught him, what they have given him by way of the legacy of truth, this brings a noble character to that man. Number four, select your companions. Select your companions. Chapter 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, and they will, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without cause, let us swallow them alive like shield, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We'll fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. Teach your children to choose their friends. The section says that for a fleeting moment of pleasure, a seductive moment, wicked men are willing to draw you in to their plans, plans for evil, plans for harm. There is a certain rush, a certain adrenaline excitement in such behavior, such pointless, senseless gang stupidity and violence. Don't get sucked in. Don't join them. Verse 14, when they say, throw in your lot with us, don't join them. Even though they know they may get caught, that's part of the rush. The whole appeal here is based on the attraction of excitement, the attraction of power, the attraction of doing harm and getting away with it, being part of the gang. Over in chapter 2, verse 11, discretion will guard you, understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. So if you fear your God and have guarded your mind and have honored your parents by holding on to their instruction, that discretion, that wisdom, that understanding will deliver you from those who try to seduce you into the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil and rejoice in the perversity of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Verse 20, so you will walk in the way of good men and keep to the paths of righteous, of the righteous, for the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. This reminds me of an incident when I was a kid in a junior high. There was a sort of a gang, if you could call our neighborhood a gang that long ago, that liked to do mischief. And I had engaged in some of the rather harmless mischief, like sliding down the 
gutter drains all the way into the main water drain and then running up and down in those big concrete water drains. My parents didn't know I was doing that. Um, that was mischief that was harmless, but I, I was um, suckered in. And eventually they decided that they were going to go to Sears as a gang and they were going to see what they could steal. They were going to rush one department and take what they could take and get out the door. And they drew me in. And the next thing I knew, there was a security officer with his hand on the back of my neck as I exited with my stash, trying to belong. I was put in a cell in the jail, and my parents were called to come and let me out. It was embarrassing to me, embarrassing to my father, the pastor. It was also agonizingly painful to my backside, <laughs> which is exactly what I deserved, but I only did it once. You choose your friends. Don't let them choose you. Chapter 4, verse 10, Hear, my son, accept my sayings. The years of your life will be many. I've directed you in the way of wisdom. I've led you in upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded. If you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it, do not pass by it, turn away from it, and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they do evil. They eat the bread of wickedness. Choose your friends, true friends. Choose the kind of people that lift you up, not the kind of people that pull you down. A man should be known by his friends. And they should be close, loving friends who are also committed to biblical wisdom, who are honest, and who lift us up. You want to make friends of those who elevate you, not those who pull you down. So fear your God, guard your mind, honor your parents, select your companions. Here we go a little deeper. Number five, control your desires. Chapter 5, down to verse 22. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. Sin imprisons. Sin makes you a captive. Sin puts you in chains. There's some illustrations of that here in Proverbs. Back to chapter 2. And just pick it up at verse 16. To deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. Stay away from the strange woman, the foreign woman, away from home, no accountability, out of town, no one knows. Teach your sons sexual purity. Now go over to chapter 5 again and look how it starts. My son, give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion, your lips may reserve knowledge, for the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. Seduction. But in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold of Sheol, 
By the way, we're talking about here illegitimate sex, not necessarily a prostitute, not necessarily some anonymous hookup. We're talking about engaging in any kind of sexual sin, sexual relationship outside of marriage is a pathway to death. She doesn't ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She doesn't know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. And strangers will be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. You have sex with some person you don't know all of the implications of that. You don't know but what it might destroy your life in a multiple of ways. Physically, it's possible a venereal disease. Financially, it's possible a child is conceived. Your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien, and you groan at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. There I was with the people of God, knowing the truth and not listening. And I engaged in what could be totally destructive. Chapter 6, verse 20, and we've looked at this, verse, drop down to verse 24. Commandments, teaching, reproofs, discipline are to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelids, for on account of a harlot, in this case, one is reduced to a loaf of bread and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. The word adulteress here means alien. This is, this is getting caught outside your protected space. This is when you're out of town. This is when you're far away from accountability. Can a man take, verse 27, fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Verse 32, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. Did you hear that? His reproach will not be blotted out. If you want to lead in the church and be above reproach, you can't have that in your background. And God will not spare in the day of vengeance, nor will He accept any ransom, nor will He be satisfied though you give many gifts. That would be referring to, first of all, her husband, but certainly would be God's attitude as well. And then chapter 7 is a long statement on the same thing all the way through this chapter, you have a picture of someone who is a fool because he is seduced. If you just look down at verse 6, you see the drama unfold. At the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice. I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. This is the seductress. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She's now in the streets, now in the squares, lurks by every corner, seizes him, kisses him with a brazen face. She says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. I paid my vows. Therefore, I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. This is a woman on the hunt, and all the tactics are laid out. I've spread my couch, verse 16, with coverings, colored linens of Egypt, sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves. Verse 19, for my husband is not home. 
My son, guard your desires. Don't put yourself in a place where you're out of control. It's disastrous. Go to verse 22. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until an arrow pierces through his liver and a bird hastens to the, as a bird hastens to the snare so he doesn't know that it will cost him his life. That's the kill. So the therefore, in verse 24, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart run aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. And he is not done. Chapter 9, verse 13, the woman of folly is boisterous, naive, knows nothing, sits at the doorway of her house on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, making their paths straight. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he doesn't know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. What does God require of a man? That he subdue his evil desires. Number six, be faithful to your wife. Be faithful to your wife. Back in chapter 5, verse 15, drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. That's a euphemistic way of saying enjoy the relationship with your own wife. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths, and his own iniquities will capture the wicked. He will be held with the cords of his sin, and he will die for lack of instruction. This world is filled with seductive temptations that confront men and women. Men are particularly vulnerable. That's why you make a covenant before God when you get married. Then you make a covenant with God to be pure. Then you make a covenant with your eyes. Then you make a covenant with your feet. And you avoid the places of temptation. What does God expect of a man? Fear your God. Guard your mind. Honor your parents. Select your companions. Control your desires. Enjoy your wife. Number seven. Watch your words. Watch your words. Go back to chapter four of Proverbs. This is so practical. Verse 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Another way to say that, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth and speak the truth. Chapter 5, verse 2. Observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. When you open your mouth, you, you should be speaking truth. Chapter 6, verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, is the one who walks with a perverse mouth. And then over in chapter 10, a number of statements are made here. 
Verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. On the lips of the discerning, wisdom is found. On the lips of the discerning, wisdom is found. Verse 18, he who conceals hatred has lying lips. That's flattery. Verse 19, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. Verse 21, the lips of the righteous feed many. Verse 31, the mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom but the perverted tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous bring forth what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverted. All through Proverbs, over and over and over again, the mouth is addressed. The lips of the righteous speak wisely. The lips of the righteous bring eternal life. The lips of the righteous are a fountain of life, as we read. Chapter 15, the lips of the righteous are a tree of life. As we read chapter 10, verse 20, the lips of the righteous are like choice silver. They are satisfying, chapter 12. They feed others. Chapter 10, they bring healing and deliverance. Again, chapter 12. The lips of the righteous speak patiently, kindly, wisely, truthfully, honestly, purely, softly, gently. They speak the things of God. On the other hand, the mouth of fools pour out crooked speech, folly, violence, hatred, malice, too many words, strife, ruin, slander, belittlement, gossip, disguise, lying, scorching fire, mischief, and perversity. Watch your words. Number eight, in the practical design for sons, for men, pursue your work. Pursue your work. Work is a blessing. Yes, it came as a curse, but It is a curse that is essentially a blessing because it allows you to exercise productivity in a fallen world. Back in chapter 6, the Proverbs address laziness, as you know. So here's industry illustrated by ants. Go to the ant, oh sluggard, chapter 6, verse 6. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler. So there's nobody ruling over the ants. And that is to say, without some big ant cracking the whip, they work. They prepare food in the summer and gather provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. Laziness. You are to be diligent in pursuing your work. Chapter 10, a couple of verses. Verse 4, poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. If you don't work, you rob yourself. Wasting time, wasting talent, wasting opportunity, wasting earning power, all these things end up with self-inflicted poverty. Chapter 10, verse 2, ill-gotten gains do not profit. You don't want to earn your money illegally, crookedly. You want to earn it by working hard. 
According to Proverbs, the lazy man will suffer hunger, chapter 19, poverty, chapter 10, failure, chapter 13. Why? Because he is sleeping through the harvest, because he wants but won't work for what he wants, because he loves sleep, he is glued to his bed, and that's repeated several times in further portions of Proverbs, and he follows worthless pursuits and he tries illegally to profit. On the other hand, the man who pursues his work earns a good living, chapter 10, 12, 13, has plenty to eat, chapter 12, is rewarded for his effort, effort, chapter 12, earns the right to have respect, even respect from kings, chapter 22. Work hard. Just a couple more. Number nine. Manage your money. Manage your money. You're working hard. You have a responsibility to be careful as a steward of what God has provided through your work. Chapter 3, verse 9. And here's how you manage your money. Honor the Lord from your wealth. Honor the Lord from your your wealth. Use uh, the money that you have to honor the Lord. And from the first of all your produce, you tithe as in the Old Testament, the first of the crop, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Manage your money to honor the Lord and the Lord will bless you. That's a promise. Over to chapter 6, a warning. If you have become surety, or that means to guarantee a loan for your neighbor, have given a pledge for a stranger, if you have been snared with the words of your mouth and have been caught with the words of your mouth, do this then, my son, and deliver yourself since you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go humble yourself and plead with your neighbor. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from a hunter's hand and like a bird from a hand of the fowler. What is this talking about? Never co-sign a loan with a stranger. Why? Because you have abandoned your stewardship. You have literally put your assets into a liability situation and you have no control. Because if you have co-signed, unless it's obviously someone in your family, you're liable for someone else's default. You want to manage your money for the Lord. Control your money to honor the Lord. Take care of your financial obligations. Fulfill your own responsibility with your money. I, I was with some people just this last week who were moaning, very wealthy people, moaning the fact that they put their assets as backing for someone who defrauded them. This is very, very common. Why is that wrong? Well, it's wrong to be defrauded. I mean, it's wrong to defraud someone. But, but what Proverbs is saying is you are responsible for this money. You don't yield up that responsibility to someone else. And one final lesson to round out the ten, serve your neighbor. Serve your neighbor. Chapter 3, verse 27, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it, like in the New Testament, be warm, be filled, and give them nothing. Don't ever say, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not devise harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you. Do not contend with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. This is generosity. In managing your money, you honor the Lord, and one way you honor the Lord, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is to take 
to look at your neighbor and love your neighbor as yourself. And one way you do that is by giving your neighbor what your neighbor needs when he needs it. Don't argue. Don't generate conflict with your neighbor. Serve your neighbor. Fear your God. Guard your mind. Honor your parents. Select your companions. Control your desires. Watch your words. Pursue your work. Manage your money. Serve your neighbor. Now, that takes us through those ten, but I want to give you kind of a final insight here. You know who wrote all this, right? You know who wrote all this? Solomon. Yes, Solomon is the one who wrote all this, or as is referred to in chapter 31 by another name, Lemuel, name according to ancient Jewish tradition for Solomon. Um, Solomon really didn't do too well with a lot of this, did he? No, I'd say he is a, a very disillusioned man when you read the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says about his own life, all is emptiness and all is vanity. Solomon is saying throughout Proverbs that you need to live wisely. In fact, it was he who, when given the opportunity to ask for anything, asked for wisdom. So he had some understanding of its priority and importance. In his early life, I'm going to talk about not living wisely. In his early life, he was married to a maiden from Shunem in Lower Galilee. And uh, about that marriage, he wrote the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, which is a celebration of marital love. And the Holy Spirit inspired him to write that about love, the long poem to his beloved wife as a very young man. But then he went ahead and married 699 other women. 699 other women? Oh, yeah. And in addition, he had sexual relationships with 300 concubines. He wasn't married to. How can a man know this, write this, and live like that? Well, the fact is, he can. But the payoff shows up in the emptiness of Ecclesiastes. The good news about Ecclesiastes is he came back to God, didn't he? And he closes by saying, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Well, what was the fallout for Solomon? Well, he had a son named Rehoboam. Rehoboam completely rejected God. Why did Rehoboam reject God? Because no matter what his father said, His father was a hypocrite. You can know all the lessons, but if you don't live them, it just magnifies your hypocrisy. And the legacy is devastating to your sons. This is wisdom eminently practical so that men can be real men before God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the clarity of your word as always. I thank you for not only giving us the word of God, but giving us the spirit of God so that the word of God can be comprehended. We thank you that we have the truth teacher residing in us, 
who takes the truth and applies it to our hearts. I pray for all of us to be faithful, to learn these true principles of life. I pray for every man here to be the kind of man that would honor you. I pray for every young lady that she would, by your grace, find such a man who endeavors to live in wisdom. And that the next generation produced will see genuine wisdom lived out and not hypocrisy. We depend on your word and your spirit to keep us faithful for your glory in our Savior's name. Amen.